My name's uh, Dwayne Philby. I'm from uh, Gigaspaces, uh, Cloudify in particular. Uh, today's talk is focused on uh, hybrid orchestration, model driven in particular. Um, you know, we, we at Gigaspaces are a big fan of, uh, Cloud of, of uh, OpenStack and have been involved since the very beginning. And uh, in fact, our first cloud orchestration was on OpenStack, but there are the premise behind this talk is that there are uh, circumstances where a hybrid approach is needed or a mixture of different technologies, possibly containers, possibly cloud, possibly bare metal, um, all need to be managed uh, in a common orchestration framework. So that's what we're really focused on here. Um, and model driven is key. So. There's going to be a fair amount of uh, unpacking I need to do pretty fast here to get us to the point where the, I have a little demo at the end so that that has any meaning. I'm going to go through some of these uh, concepts to give you a background. <coughs> hmm, it's not doing anything. All right. Let's do it the hard way. Okay, so first just an introduction. This is model-driven orchestration. So. The basic, uh, the basic concept is the difference between uh, imperative versus declarative. Uh, since we're all open stackers here, we're familiar with heat and hot, and you know that's a that's an example of a, uh, um, a declarative model for uh, infrastructure and so forth. Uh, you know the alternative being something that's more script oriented, something that's very tailor made. Uh, rather than a uh, than a model, and the the basic idea behind model driven or imperative is that you're separating the nouns from the verbs <coughs> in an orchestration. So you're describing what needs to be done without necessarily exactly saying how it's going to be done. So the model represents, to some extent, represents a goal state for the system. Okay, a model by itself doesn't do anything. It just kind of lays there passively. You need something to operate on it. And that's an orchestrator. In the case of a heat template, you need heat, of course. And heat is going to take that static uh, representation and uh, actually turn it into API calls, ultimately, on the back end. So there's just a little code snippet down there of a standard YAML-based uh, model where it describes a key, an image, a flavor. Same thing would apply to network components. <coughs> if we consider a slightly more complex example with relationships, um, we have this, uh, this concept of containment and uh, connected to relationships here. For example, if I have a container inside an OpenStax uh, um, server and uh, SDN controller inside that that may be pointing at a V router in another instance. And we're going to expand on this and generalize it a little bit more. Of course, Neutron underlying all of it <coughs> in the case of OpenStack. But the model becomes more complex when we really configure relationships. And we want the orchestrator to be smart enough to take those relationships and use them in the orchestration. Um, often, mainly for the ordering of operations. So you're building a dependency graph essentially in memory. And the orchestrator is going to be building a model of tasks that have to fulfill the relationships and the target uh, nodes in the graph. So we think about that. A tool like Heat and ultimately like uh, our tool, Cloudify, you have to understand uh, implicitly understand relationships in the model. You have to understand what workflow is being run. So if I have a model, you know, install and uninstall are just two possibilities of what I could do with it. I could, I could run any kind of uh, operation on top of that. I could do software upgrades, um, you know, anything, uh, uh, anything you can imagine, really. Um, it has to understand the types in the model, the nouns. So obviously, you know, Heat understands what a server is, it understands what a network is, it understands what a port is, and a security group, and all the rest of it. But these are all implicitly baked into the uh, into the orchestrator. It has to know what API calls are associated with what types. These are the verbs. 
and it has to ex obviously execute the API calls to produce the goal that the workflow is associated with. Okay, so now if we pull back a little bit <coughs> and try to consider something more general purpose, uh, we come to Tosca. Tosca is an OASIS specification and that's what it stands for. Um, it's, despite it's uh, saying that it's for cloud applications, it's actually uh, far more general purpose than that. Cloud, cloud applications, uh, it's really, if you just eliminate the cloud, because it's any application, it's really a general purpose uh, modeling tool that can apply to virtual infrastructure, no infrastructure, uh, 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 containers, clouds, some combination of the above. So that's what we're here about. Um, and it breaks things down in really three parts. The topology, which is the model I was discussing. The workflows, which are the operations you might perform on the model. And then policies, I'm not really going to get into much here today, but the policies are the, in, in this case, are interpreted as the sort of post-deployment dynamism. So policy in the sense of self-healing, uh, auto-healing, auto-scaling, that type of thing. Um, there's, a, there's a way in which the orchestrator can associate a set of actions to the model to say, okay, if uh, these three nodes are experiencing a very high load, then I am going to incrementally uh, uh, scale that particular tier and so forth. And it goes up and down and back and forth. <coughs> the Tosca meta model is extremely unopinionated. Um, the difference, I think, where you start really coming across from heat now is that it's really almost like a programming language. It's, uh, you can define your own types, so uh, for example, we have uh, type definitions for heat itself in Tosca, but also for the individual nouns, uh, you know, routers, uh, subnets, ports, and uh, VMs, and so forth in OpenStack or any other cloud. So, so you wind up with a, a sort of a, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? You wind up with a menu of possible uh, types that, that are either provided by plugins, by third parties, or that you can create yourself to address specific needs. It has the concept of requirements and capabilities. This permits a certain type of auto wiring that can occur inside of a topology. If I don't want to specifically say I am tied to a certain type of virtual machine, I can be more general about it. I can say I need. Um, I need a Linux, uh, CentOS Linux box, at least version 7, uh, with so much RAM, so much memory, uh, that type of thing. Um, operations for verbs, so the, the model doesn't presume any operations either, so um, the model is, provides hooks basically for connecting logic, and this is where the plug-in architecture comes. Uh, you can have the model independently from what it's realizing. So <coughs> when we go to Tosca, you plug in and you have an OpenStack plugin, and the nodes that are related to OpenStack will activate the OpenStack APIs. Um, you can define your own workflows. There's certain built-in ones, install, uninstall, obviously. There's scale and heal and so forth, but there's any kind of workflow you would imagine. And the basic idea is that the, the workflow is an arbitrary uh, bit of code that the model is um, handed to, and the, it's really up to the workflow what it does with it. This is where you might fit in something like a very uh, tailored uh, upgrade uh, scenario or uh, some kind of blue-green testing or anything like that. The model is not just static either. When, a, when in the hands of the orchestrator, the model lives in memory, and, and dynamic information about the orchestration is plugged back in, just as in an object-oriented programming language. Um, you can have runtime state for, for things that are not uh, specified in advance. For example, if you're getting uh, IP addresses from DHCP or so forth, uh, you can stick those in the model and then other uh, <coughs> then workflows can actually pull that out. So if, if I'm instantiating a, a database, for example, and allocating a floating IP address to it, that floating IP can be available to other nodes in the orchestration other elements in the orchestration later on. So it handles that. And of course, user-definable policies, I'm not going to get into that, but you can do any kind of um, 
effectively real-time event processing based on metrics that you're receiving from the system to trigger workflows. All right, and uh, I gotta go faster than this. So this is just a good example of uh, Tosca in a nutshell. You have uh, properties, you have interfaces. Inter if you have a node type here, the, uh, the interfaces represent actual endpoints where functionality is connected to it. So this is, for example, if you had, if a node type you had was uh, um, uh, a uh, OpenStack server of some kind, the interface would be where the hook to the actual OpenStack API would be. Okay. The key thing to note is that those are pluggable, so that they're not, they're not fixed to the orchestration. Um, and then all the other requirements that go with it, there may be uh, connect, there may be uh, built-in uh, requirements that uh, that that node type needs. Um, and the node also has properties. This is very much in the uh, in the vein of uh, Hot itself, is that you have properties for the nodes. Those are fixed, and not mentioned on there are the runtime properties, which are dynamic. <coughs> Okay, and then this is just Cloudify's view of it. Cloudify is, is a Tosca-inspired orchestrator. And uh, basically the orchestrator sits at the center. The application blueprint comes in the front. Uh, there are many uh, plugins out there for all of these platforms. Okay, and they're um, <coughs> a given... Uh, application a blueprint is not tied to any of those and, and not only is it not tied to a single platform but within a single orchestration you're not tied to one platform so every node in a Tosco orchestration could be pointing at a different IAS provider or network SDN controller or anything so it's extremely wide open in that sense okay and then the, there's the concept of workflows there's built-in install uninstall scale heal and declarative based on the application topology. Sorry I'm going fast, but this is turning into a lightning talk now. Um, I'll skip over policies here. <coughs> okay, so now we get to at least some background for the hybrid orchestration example. So the concept uh, for this talk is a, is a hybrid uh, environment where we have Kubernetes running on bare metal, actually, and a database running in OpenStack. And how do we orchestrate that? <laughs> okay. So we're running our old famous, uh, our old uh, favorite uh, Node.js demo called uh, Node Seller. And uh, this is just a peek into the actual configuration. It, it, there's no point in really digging into this too much, but we do have the idea of the Kubernetes masters. This is a, a snippet from the Kubernetes uh, orchestration. You can see how the Kubernetes master has a relationship here that it's contained in the Kubernetes master host. The master host looks a lot like the definition of a virtual machine for a heat template. The one thing to note here though is that I don't actually have bare metal here. I don't have like a rack I'm gonna bring in. So all I did was for the, for the demo was to create a couple virtual machines in advance. And we have a plugin called the Host Pool plugin, which basically manages a set of IP addresses, lets you attach characteristics to them, and then refer to them in an orchestration as though they were being spawned by a cloud infrastructure as a service. So, so in any case, we have the master here. You see all the settings for uh, uh, Kubernetes here. We have the flannel, etcd, and all that good stuff. Uh, the way this was actually implemented is using the uh, Docker multi-node that uh, Google supplies anyway, just for simplicity. We also have another orchestration that goes down and breaks down every component as well. <coughs> now, the, on the other side, we have a separate uh, orchestration called MongoDB. So this is just starting a MongoDB server, and it's the same pattern here. We have, we have a MongoD. Um, um, we've actually got the, uh, the Mongo database here. It's got a replica set. I'm not going to go into the scaling of that. I have another demo where I actually scale that based on the activity in Kubernetes, but it's not going to be time. 
and then that is relying on the MongoD host. And the orchestrator will order this by noting this dependency here based on the relationship. <coughs> start the uh, start the OpenStack instance and then install the MongoD on it. Okay. All right, then there's one more service. So I broke this into three different orchestrations because I thought that was more realistic. All these could live, live in one orchestration, but then they'd all have a common life cycle, which I don't think is terribly realistic. Um, so this is the actual hybrid node seller service. And in this case, we're taking the, the approach of a custom type called a Kubernetes microservice up here. And what it does is try not to disturb the native Kubernetes configuration. So it takes as input, <laughs> you'll note the files here. There's a, there's a file up there called pod.yaml, a file here called service2.yaml. The service is, doesn't really change for this, but, the, but what we can do here is through a custom plugin, we can override these informa the information like the Mongo IP port and the uh, uh, certain environment variables that are needed for monitoring and so forth. These get plugged into the actual Kubernetes uh, container descriptor. And when the service is rendered, then Kubernetes actually, the, the Kubernetes service can actually contact the MongoD, which is running externally. Okay, I think we're getting close to the end, so that's the end of the slides. Let me get to the Cloudify. All right. So this is just a this is a high level view of the Cloudify <coughs> UI. Uh, it's not the latest Cloudify UI, but uh, it's good enough. So here we see the Node Seller, which is the app. It's actually connected to two external orchestrations. So these are references. This is another example of the power of plugins. This Kubernetes proxy and Mongo proxy are actually separate orchestrations that are running. So this allows us to do a sort of a composition of orchestrations, each of which can have their own uh, scope of responsibility, but which they can still exchange information to each other. Um, now if I go in here and I say execute workflow on here, I will pick, you see we have a number of workflows like scale, install, and so forth. In this case, I do want install. And hopefully the gods of demos are cooperating with me today. So what's happening now, the, <coughs> the plugin is actually pulling the information from Mongo, um, from MongoDB. It's plugging it into the Kubernetes configuration. It's shipping the Kubernetes configuration to the Kubernetes master node, where it's actually instantiating the service and bringing it up. And the, all the green check marks are there. And we should be able to say site can be reached now. <coughs> and it's there, OK? Now that, uh, obviously, this was all done in OpenStack, because that's the cloud I'm working on. But there's no particular reason why that Kubernetes instance I'm running was located on any particular set of IP infrastructure. That was just, I just gave it a list of IP addresses. It installed, installed that, and then I just pointed the uh, service at both endpoints, and it tied everything together. Um, so the power of that, too, is that the service can respond to scaling events from Kubernetes, for example. It's a little bit far-fetched, but um, if you're, uh, for example, monitoring the, uh, the CPU workload on the on the uh, Node.js nodes and they reach a certain capacity. Obviously, Kubernetes itself can handle scaling of Node.js, so we don't need to handle that in our orchestrator. But if it gets to a certain threshold and I want to scale MongoDB, and that is a, a clustered MongoDB uh, blueprint, then the orchestrator can actually scale MongoDB as well on a completely separate platform. So the, 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 uh, the connection can be uh, very intimate there. And that's, that's it.